This week on Heroes Made in the USA. Heroes who do it their way. New Haven doctor Bernie Siegel has taken on the medical community over cancer treatment. He says love and hope is as important as chemotherapy. Reverend Cecil Williams of San Francisco is a self-confessed entertainer and politician. And his Glide Memorial Church packs them in from the Tenderloin District to Knob Hill. Nonviolent resistance may be past its prime in some quarters, but Cesar Chavez is still using it as a weapon against toxic agricultural pesticides. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. Welcome to Heroes Made in the USA and Heroes Who Do It Their Way. One of the marks of a hero is the imagination and courage to do things differently, break new ground. Take our first hero, for example. Despite the disapproval of the American medical community, New Haven's Dr. Bernie Siegel cures cancer his way. And I had advanced cancer and had metastasized through three areas of my body. And I was on extensive chemotherapy and radiation. And after all of that, the cancer was still growing. At that point, I was starting to lose all of my um, reflexes. I was hardly able to walk. And um, I knew that if I wanted to live, I had to do something. Now, I don't use the term dying anymore. Dying of cancer. What dead. Eileen did was seek out revolutionary alive. cancer doctor, I'm Bernie Siegel. Because right. I'm not trying to create villains of doctors, but I think our training is terrible. You're not taught how to deal with people, how to communicate with people. I read something the other day, I think by Voltaire, it said, uh, doctors give medications of which they know little for diseases of which they know less to people of which they know nothing. And I think this is a big part of it. We are not taught anything about people. We're taught about diseases. But Dr. Siegel combined his knowledge of people with his education on disease to add a new dimension to cancer treatment, utilizing techniques such as self-hypnosis, visualization, and art therapy. Rosemary was dying of cancer until she began working with Bernie Siegel. For Dr. Siegel, I just could not understand picking up crayons at my time in life because I'm not an artist, and I couldn't understand what that was all about. When he read the drawings back to me on my first visit, he right away picked up there was something happening in my family, and uh, I realized that, my God, there is something to this whole thing. So we deal with life and its conflicts so that you feel good and have peace of mind. You learn how to deal with adversity. Then I say, yeah, talk to your body, because I know from my operating room experience that if I tell a patient to tell their blood to go away from the part I'm going to operate on, they will lose less blood in the operating room. So I say, send you chemotherapy where you want it, tell the blood not to go where you want it. And the other is through images, that we also can affect our body through imagery. And just move through your body, repairing and cleansing, and feeling the peace move down as a wave through your body. It's your body, you are somebody. There's a strength in your limbs, just as in your tree of life, every limb has great strength. Dr. Siegel also created a support group so patients could learn and grow through sharing their experiences. The body is all self-healing. And I believe it now, but I believe it. But the trouble is, I think I need some help. I need help because of the doubt that has been created in my mind for the last two years and the failures that I have gone through. So that uh, I feel that there's something other than just chemotherapy. Bernie Siegel defies the criticism of the mainstream medical community in order to continue improving and saving the lives of his cancer patients. Dr. Ezra Greenspan from the Mount Sinai Medical Center is one of the pioneers of chemotherapy. I think Bernie Siegel is a remarkably uh, smooth um, soothsayer. He's, a, he's very charming, and, he's, and, he's, uh, and, if, and to listen to him on tape or to read his book is certainly uh, an interesting experience. But this has nothing to do with the treatment of incurable disseminated cancer. The problem is when you look in the medical literature and you find 3,000 cases which are there of spontaneous remission, so-called, what I call self-induced healing, in only one case did they mention the person's life story. And that said, the woman's much despised husband died whereupon she got well. Now, that's the part I think doctors have forgotten. There is an experience to illness. You have to ask people. 
Why did you get well when you weren't supposed to? See, we never study success. You don't do well, come back, I'll give you a new course of therapy. You know, we'll hit you harder, blast you, poison you, kill what's inside of you. That ought to make you feel good. Um, it does. If you don't have an effective drug, the right pill or the right uh, intravenous medicine, uh, all the optimism in the world makes no difference in the outcome. Feeling good is physiologic. Solzhenitsyn said there is a physiology to optimism. Of course there is. Um, I know patients who have died in 10 or 15 minutes when a doctor took hope away. I mean, the doctor literally, with his words, killed that individual. The relationship Dr. Siegel develops with his patients is not clinical. It is personal. Instead of just healing with drugs, he heals with love. I put a call into Dr. Siegel. Meanwhile, I'm having this horrible experience with doctors. And I thought, well, if he's like the others, I'll hear from him in a couple of months or his secretary will call. A couple of days later, I get a call from the airport. And it says, he says, this is Bernie Siegel. And I said, what? <laughs> I was so shocked, I couldn't believe that this doctor who I had no idea, I mean, I had never met him or anything, he actually called me from the airport? I mean, when, when do you get a doctor to do this? So right then and there, I knew I was on the right track. There is always hope. Hope is not statistical. Pathology reports do not predict the future. And if you want to be immortal, love somebody. Coming up next on Heroes Made in the USA, Reverend Cecil Williams of San Francisco, marching to the beat of a different drummer, and Cesar Chavez, founding father of the United Farm Workers. Our next hero looks like a 60s militant, works a crowd like a politician, and conducts his Sunday service like a rock star. In other words, Reverend Cecil Williams is not your traditional man of the cloth. While other ministers feed souls, Reverend Williams feeds empty stomachs. While other ministers prepare their congregations for the hereafter, Reverend Williams equips his followers for the here and now. Amen. 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 When I came here, the church was about to close its doors. So I went for all the people who were the left outs and the leftovers. Cecil Williams Church Service has been written up as the only Sunday morning nightclub. Rather than worship, we had to celebrate. I went for the outsiders. I went for the dispossessed. Rather than put them down and keep them down, we had to celebrate life for them. It seems to me that God may be, at this time in history, suffering with those who suffer first. That God may not be in the big temples and the big churches, but God may be with the homeless. My goal is to create a new community in the city of San Francisco with the homeless and the poor. This is one place in America and in the world where those who have been desperate, the outcasts, are no longer the outcasts. I want to eliminate poverty. I want people who are poor to have power. I want to help walk with them because that's where I came from. My guts are there. You can't begin to give power to someone concentrating on survival. So Reverend Williams first seeds to the basic needs of the poor. If it wasn't for Cecil, say there'd be a lot of people, a lot of them out in the cold. For instance, for the people that are on the streets, um, he, he uh, feeds them. Well, yeah, it's me. I go to Glide, eat scrambled eggs, milk. The church feeds two to 3,000 people per day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Their 23 social and cultural programs range from teaching teenagers about AIDS to instructing new mothers about infant care. It's like my father. You know, I came to the city and didn't know no one. He said, hey, can you run the dining room for me? My brothers and my sisters, I'm trying to say to you that you have power. You have power. Because you have destiny. You have the stuff of life if you begin. 
Getting food, jobs, and housing for the poor takes money, and Reverend Williams sometimes uses controversial tactics in obtaining funding. New hotel developers in the area immediately get a call from Cecil Williams. I say to them that if you want to certainly build in our community, or close to our community, it means that what you do is you push us out. And we don't want our people pushed out. Therefore, you must be concerned about housing for them. You must be concerned about jobs for them. Of the three new hotels built in the area, Reverend Williams has secured 250 jobs for the jobless. And each hotel will donate $50,000 per year for four years for services for the people in need. I think that the reason that the developers want to do this is because um, Cecil Williams um, will delay the building of their projects. There are those theologians who would argue with me and say, it's up to God. No, it's up to you. It's your life. I it's did drugs and I say, well, what difference does it ever really make? Well, Cecil taught me, yes, it does make a difference, and I make a difference. And if it had not been for him, I probably never would have gotten that message. Last year, I was diagnosed with AIDS, and uh, I did an article for the newspaper. Cecil saw it in the paper, gave me a call. The church has helped me out with the medical expenses. I can't think of a better ally in fighting the disease than Cecil. I have great drama about what I do. I, I don't fake it. I am uh, an entertainer, and I am a politician. Cecil Williams leads the Easter Sunrise Service and fights for civil rights with the same zeal. Rallies, protests, even going to jail are part of his life. I will continue to protest, will continue to dissent. I have done it because it seems to me as a minister, I can do no, no less. Most ministers find it difficult to really be human. I want to be the most human person who may be called a minister. There is nothing that I'm not afraid to do. My ministry says, do everything you possibly can. And that, to me, means giving my life. Coming up next on Heroes Made in the USA, Cesar Chavez brings nonviolent protest into the 80s and hometown heroes fighting to protect their environmental heritage. In the 60s, Cesar Chavez became the first man to successfully organize farm labor in the United States. Using the techniques perfected by Gandhi and Martin Luther King, he forced California grape growers to accept the union. And now the only surviving national leader associated with, with passive resistance has again declared his own brand of war on behalf of farm workers. Central California's agricultural belt plays a major role in the state's billion-dollar grape growing industry. This region is also the home and workplace for hundreds of California's farm workers. Something is happening in the quiet towns where whole families of farm workers toil 10 to 12 hours a day, pesticide spraying and death. I've been very ill. I had four miscarriages, and ever since. I'm afraid because I think it's pesticides. The pesticide spraying has placed in the headlines a man who's all too familiar with the California farms and its farm workers, Cesar Chavez. War on the pesticides that are poisoning and killing our people. Wherever possible, let's make sure that the grapes turn into raisins on the, on the vine. This let's land sure has been the, the site of many confrontations for Chavez over the years. The founding father of the United Farm Workers Union, who in the late 60s and 70s used nonviolent tactics to force grape and lettuce growers to accept their union, now lives in La Paz, California, and hasn't stopped living a life of activism for his people. The best way to communicate to people is through actions. Not through words, through actions. Just do it. I go through great uh, lengths not to, to speak a lot and not to write a lot about what we're doing, but to act a lot. Just do it. As with most champions of civil rights, there is a turning point. Caesars came one Sunday at the age of 17 in the small town of Delano, California. And I went to the show on that Sunday. I'm planned, I had no idea why I did it. I just 
decided to go to the other side where I was supposed to go. And that created a big ruckus. I mean, it's just like, it's the biggest thing hit Delano. I was jailed and uh, uh, beaten up by the cops, you know, although I was very nonviolent. But I made a statement, and that was, what led me to do that, I don't know. But after I did that, then my life changed. And, and I've been doing things since then. I think to the everlasting glory of the farm workers that they've been able to, to hold back and to, and to continue to, to, to espouse the whole idea of nonviolence. My mother is a nonviolent person and taught us a lot, a lot about nonviolence, but, but really what she used to say is don't be afraid. Don't use violence, but don't be afraid to to uh, you know, stand up for truth and against injustice. And so they did it. My, my dad and my mother would do that. And we're from workers. My mother is illiterate. My father barely could read and write. But they would do these things. And we saw it, and so it became second nature to us. In 1962, against the absolute worst of odds, Cesar Chavez, with eight children, quit his paying job while his wife went to work in the fields. He organized the United Farm Workers Union of America. We're trying to say, look, we have a union, recognize us. That was a real fight. At the benefits we wanted was, of course, drinking water and uh, all of the indignities that women suffer because they have to go to the bathroom in the weeds, you know, and, and or sometimes wait all day, as men do, you know, because there's not a bathroom, or there's, not, there's no way to drink water. I mean, in, I mean, things that won't cost any money, just inhuman uh, treatment of workers. Despite many brutal beatings and extreme violence, he continued. His organizing and boycotting many times brought death threats. I think it was a moment of apprehension, but that was the first time that I heard that there was a, like a contract against me, on me. And then after you pass that first experience, then. Uh, there's a way to, to deal with that. There's been some, you know, some moments of a lot of pressure, you know, and, and uh, some close calls, but thanks God we're still here. Protesting in the 60s was not an easy task. The method he used was essentially that of nonviolence, also practiced by other civil rights leaders of the day. Senator Kennedy wasn't afraid to come into the valley and take a stand. From what I knew and what I saw and, and the experiences with him, he really cared and was willing to, to lay it on the line. In this kind of work, it's, it's, it's also a very lonely feeling to lose people who can speak up, you know, for the things you believe in and to act and to, and well, give, up, give their lives up for it. What is your number? Chavez is full of energy. When he could sit back and reflect on his years of organizing, Cesar Chavez keeps going. I should live a long time. I still have a lot of years of uh, contribution. In fact, my contributions are multiplying now that I'm older and wiser. I can do more things with less time and energy. I wish I knew this much when I, was, when I first started. It's a great joy to see people lose their fear. My biggest mission is that things happen, but they need to happen through people, not through me. And now, this week's hometown hero. For more than 50 years, the members of the Tryon Garden Club have made it their business to protect their garden. 250 acres in the heart of North Carolina's Appalachian Highlands. Like any perfect garden, it has a centerpiece, Pearson Falls. The group lobbied the state of North Carolina, and now Pearson Falls is a designated protected natural heritage area forever. I've looked at that waterfall for what, 25, uh, six years, and it brings back to mind when I walk over that bridge, it's just nature. For protecting the natural beauty of their hometown, the women of the Tryon Garden Club are this week's hometown heroes. Heroes are innovators who make the future rather than wait for it to happen. 